So I think we should go ahead and uh, start with this webinar. Um, welcome everyone. My name is Isabel Hogbrink. I'm the Director of Communications at South Pole and I'm delighted to have you all today to listen in on a webinar on the role of the private sector, what is the right thing to do. So first, a couple of housekeeping rules. Um, you're all on mute and, um, and that is of course easier that way, uh, but we do encourage you to provide questions in our question box at any time and we hope to spend the last 30 minutes on a lively Q&A session. So we welcome all your questions at any time in, during the webinar. Um, we are broadcasting from our homes, and so do forgive any technical issues or background noise. And finally, this webinar will be recorded and we'll send out a recording uh, quite soon, possibly even today, to everyone who has signed up for this webinar. So without further ado, uh, let me introduce to you the speakers. We're delighted to have Renat Hoiberger here with us today, CEO and co-founder of South Pole, as well as Maria Carvalho, who's our public affairs specialist and a senior policy consultant. She's very much involved in these types of uh, issues. So uh, before we start uh, um, a discussion, just a couple of words from me on this topic. Um, in a world where government action and ambition is lagging, even where countries like Germany and Sweden are not meeting their climate targets, we see that the private sector needs to step up to meet the enormous climate challenge. However, our question is, do they truly feel the urgency of the matter? Do they feel ready for and comfortable with the role of implementing scaled up transformational climate action? At South Pole, we certainly hope so. We work with thousands of private companies and here on this, um, on this slide are some of them. And we think that there's a clear business case for climate action. We try to show how this is not a burden for companies, it's an opportunity and they can turn sustainability into a competitive advantage. So we want to walk away from the alarmist discussions in the media and elsewhere that people who try to pick apart the VCM, the voluntary carbon market, and instead look at the bigger picture, the success to date and the potential for the future. And so without further ado, let me welcome Renat to start the discussion with the following question. Renat, why is the private sector key and why is the voluntary carbon market needed? Thanks a lot, uh, Isabel, for the question. Also from my side, warmly welcome to this webinar. Uh, exciting to have all of you uh, here. Um, Isabel, the, the answer to this question, I think the next slides can nicely give us. Uh, here on this slide, you can see how historically carbon emissions have gone up from 1990 now to 2020 and if you look at the yellow prediction this is how emissions would have to unfold or emission levels if we were to achieve a two degrees target and the green line shows what would have to happen if we were to achieve a 1.5 degrees target now if we look at what currently we have in under the Paris Agreement in terms of government pledges and policies, there the story looks quite different. So even if all the pledges and policies that have been made under the Paris Agreement were actually becoming a reality, we would still be very far away from a two degrees target. And even to make things worse, as we all know, a pledge alone or an NDC alone does not mean that the government actually has a policy in place, a regulation that has real world impact on the economy. Now, this is where the private sector comes in. We simply need to finance climate action beyond those targets. And even within these targets, we need private sector action to kickstart initiatives. Because again, what's the point of having a nice plan if nobody invests against this plan. So that's, I guess, the short answer to the question why we need private sector finance. And so um, I think um, you're also going to talk a little bit about the fact that hmm. government pledges are fine and, and private sector net zero targets are fine, but they're not enough. So what do we need beyond that? So perhaps for this, if you give me the next slide, 
Um, here, this is a graph you might have seen before. It's from the Climate Policy Institute, CPI, the so-called spaghetti diagram. Uh, as you can see, the, uh, the spaghetti diagram shows all a lot of nice spaghettis and noodles. And here, essentially, what this, what is this, this picture shows on the left is where does the money come from? And on the right, where does the money go? We're talking here about climate finance into the global south. And you can see that we have already, the, the orange bar shows us there's all already a significant amount of private sector finance coming into the picture. Um, you can see the other big one is uh, mutual DFIs, like the, the World Banks and other development banks of, uh, that we have. Um, so we have the private sector pretty well represented already in climate finance. But you look on, uh, on the right side, you can see that the majority of the current climate funding is going into renewable energy and transport. That is not surprisingly, uh, not surprising. We have come a long way in terms of renewables in, in many countries. Renewable energy is actually the, the least cost option now. But if you look on the right side, a little bit higher up, land use is a tiny spaghetti there. So. Climate finance currently works quite well, even from the private sector, for uh, renewables and, and, and transport programs and even energy efficiency, but not really a lot at all for land use program or a project in the nature-based solution space. And that has a reason to which we come in a second. And of course, the answer, yeah, so let me first give you, uh, uh, show you the next slide. And the answer is very simple. Let's look at a very concrete example. Uh, of a land-based project. Here is a project in Ghana in the cocoa industry. Um, as many of you, I guess, know, um, Ghana has, has a problem. The desert is growing. Um, the tradition in Ghana is to have monocultures that to plant cocoa only, but that is not healthy for the plants and the soil. Uh, cocoa needs need, need shade trees. So one solution, one actually very profitable solution to do is to invest in agroforestry, uh, as, as you can see in this field, where you plant shade trees um, to protect your, your, your cocoa. Well, what that means is you're making money in the midterm, but in the short term, somebody needs to invest because you, in the short term, you will have less profit from your cocoa and, and you have to plant new trees. So who is financing that? What financing options does she have? to invest in agroforestry. She will not qualify for a bank loan because she's unbankable. She will not qualify for a soft loan from the World Bank because those loans start at $50 million. She needs $10,000, so absolutely not the right size. She, nobody will invest equity. What does she have in terms of options? She could perhaps be lucky enough to get a grant from some NGO. The only other option is carbon finance. And uh, let me come in a second to why that's the case and why carbon finance is such an important instrument to actually drive change on the ground. The reason is investments in land-based solutions are tricky for a number of reasons. Typically, we talk about small aggregated deals. We talk about um, it, 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 it's a big uh, plot of land, but the actual takers are perhaps farmers. As we discussed, Many of them have low creditworthiness. Bankability is a problem. They make uh, making them uneligible for, for lending. We have typically complex ownership structures. It happens a lot of times that the land is not owned by the same person who is farming the land. Sometimes cooperatives are involved. So it's, it's in, in, and that happens to be different from country to country. So not really what big banks like in terms of uh, big loans. And of course, you have currency risks. Uh, you need shilling in Uganda and not US dollars. And um, so all these problems are part of the reason why big money is not flowing into regenerative agriculture. But carbon finance is different. Carbon finance treats farmers as business partners. How is that possible? If we give a loan to a farmer and we don't expect this loan to be paid back, but we take carb credits as a payback, a number of things changed. First of all, these carbon credits are bought by companies like Isabel just showed in the slides in Europe and in hard currency. So 
we have transferred the risk uh, um, away and now we all of a sudden talk about hard currency uh, contracts. Uh, also, um, by uh, using current finance, we are able to aggregate. We can roll out the program, which for example, using satellite-based data is able to capture thousands of farmers and is able to judge whether or not uh, uh, farming uh, has been done differently. And through new technologies, we're even able to actually compensate those farmers, for example, through a token put on a wallet. Uh, keep in mind, many of the farmers have uh, have mobile phones, they're, they're mobile banking. So carbon finance is a very interesting instrument that is game changing uh, uh, specifically for nature-based solutions. And I wanted to basically uh, flag this because too often in these discussions about voluntary carbon, we are looking only at the company side. And the question we have is, uh, you know, can you account for it and not? And, and, but I wanted to make it very clear that carbon finance itself has a very important role in our quest to reduce and remove emissions from the atmosphere, specifically in nature-based solutions. Now, this shows, uh, leads me to my last slide, uh, Isabel, two last slides. Luckily, voluntary carbon markets have actually grown quite a lot. We come from very low levels uh, 10 years ago, but over the past two years alone, those markets have doubled. And what you can see here is the amount of tons of CO2. Now, luckily as well, price levels have increased a lot. So if we had the same slide in terms of, uh, uh, of, of money, we would see even steeper uh, increases here on this slide. And if you give me my last slide, please. Here is what how these markets should grow if we really want to fully exploit the potential of the voluntary car markets to help the world reach the Paris Agreement. Um, you, you see a, quite a, a dramatic increase. And that is not just like a, a wishful thinking. Uh, our experience we have had over the past couple of months is that we have now such a lot of interests from the private sector, from companies in contributing to finance the transition that I actually personally am quite uh, positive that these figures can actually be reached and voluntary climate action, proper impact accounting, result-based uh, financing will play a key role for us to really meet the Paris Agreement, particularly in places where classic finance, classic instruments don't go. Thank you, Bernard. And so let's move away a little bit from the why. That was very clear, why the private sector is needed and why the voluntary carbon market is a good vehicle. And let's look at the how with Maria. So Maria, how exactly is the private sector supposed to get involved? What's the what's the ask from them? How do they um, get involved in, in, the, in the voluntary carbon market? That's great. Uh, thanks, Isabel. And if we could go to the next slide. So, Isabel, your question is a, something that we're really helping companies with because they are not used to tracking their greenhouse gas emissions and they don't know how to actually reduce it over time. And so what we do is actually set out this notion of a climate journey, which is to help companies in actually measuring their carbon footprint. And what that means is the greenhouse gases associated that's coming from their operations and value chains. And so that is a really good way of not only measurement, but also figuring out what your risk is, particularly as more stringent climate policy comes into place. So there is a cost to your emissions and you want to figure out how to reduce it. We also help companies then to figure out how to, what are the, to figure out a roadmap of the types of actions that they need to take to reduce their emissions and how to actually through those sets of actions measure what the reductions would be to move towards a target. So that kind of roadmap helps towards setting the stage on target setting, but it also helps companies in figuring out what to reduce over time. And what they cannot reduce, we really suggest to finance climate action um, through buying carbon credits, because as your emissions continue to go up, it should be compensated somewhere else to drive that faster climate action. So our main message here is just to do everything, not just one thing, we really don't have time to wait, but if you were to take this very comprehensive approach, 
um, you can also communicate it in a very transparent and comprehensive way, which is very exciting to your stakeholders. And how does a company know when they're ambitious enough? Yeah, that's also another great question. So this is our key thing is the most ambitious target you could set is, is when it's aligned to climate science. And this is not something just that governments are being expected to do. There's a lot more reporting standards that are coming out, like the Science-Based Target Initiative and ISO Carbon Neutrality, which is requiring that level of ambition. And this figure was designed just to help companies to understand what does that look like. Um, the gray dashed line would be uh, illustrative of what your business as usual emissions would be if you were to do nothing. But if you were to set a target, it could be to an alignment of a two degree target, uh, which is the Paris target. So it would be what would your emissions trajectory have to look like to reduce, uh, to eventually get to net zero at a two degree time, or you could be even more ambitious what would that trajectory of reductions have to look like to get to a 1.5 degree target? And so the difference between that gray dashed line uh, and basically your trajectory, which is seen uh, by the dark blue below, uh, you can see the level of reductions that you'd have to reduce over time through your own actions, but you could also buy carbon credits through avoided emissions or through removing emissions. So those types of credits are really important as a way of uh, neutralizing or compensating for emissions that you just cannot avoid. And so those emissions we call residual emissions, but we see this as a two-pronged approach to uh, achieving your climate targets. And so um, you just spoke about offsets. So let's talk about that in greater detail. We know that offsets are key because they funnel important financing to projects around the world that are lowering emissions. And, and Renat mentioned some of these types of projects and nature-based uh, solutions. But we, you know, we work with all kinds of projects, uh, and these projects need financing today, as Renat mentioned. But some people criticize companies using offsets because they say that it stops their own emission reductions, internal emission reductions. Uh, they they say that it makes them less likely to lower their own emissions. Is that in fact true? Actually, so we're seeing a very, very interesting trend with the companies we are working with and specifically the ones who are setting net zero targets or carbon neutral targets, because that's a very different decision making approach to those companies that only buy uh, a handful of carbon credits, um, as, which is a small, small part of their carbon footprint. But for those ones who are setting net zero targets, it really changes how they have to think about buying carbon credits because they now have to cover carbon credits to the volume that covers all their residual emissions and not just for one year but for all the years going forward and therefore the carbon credits actually sets a price for all your carbon emissions and now if you're a financial planner of that company you have to think how much of my budget am i do i want to go towards reducing emissions for someone else to do that? Or should I actually use that same budget to invest in my own emissions? And so there's a real budgetary trade-off here. How much money because of the amount of volume I would need to buy if I were to constantly offset my residual emissions? And that, that it really creates an incentive to reduce your own emissions and that incentive becomes stronger as carbon credit prices increase. So we are seeing this trend with companies we're working with who are setting these net zero targets and they have to do that kind of financial planning but what's really interesting is we're not the only ones who are seeing that a uh, 2018 report by ecosystems marketplace did a survey that showed that companies that do offset are more likely to have a climate action plan than the, their peers who don't and so we see offsetting as part of a broader corporate strategy and so this critique that I mentioned that um, some people voice where they say companies who offset aren't going to be serious about lowering their own emissions, that's that's actually not true. That's not what we see. When you have to buy that much volume of emissions, it really sets a price on your residual emissions. And you really have to ask, why would I be paying um, someone else to reduce their emissions if it's more cost effective for me to reduce my own emissions? And so that carbon price, the very act of buying a carbon credit really forces you to make some decisions between uh, how you allocate your budgets. And as as you mentioned, as the price goes up to the cost, to the real cost of emissions, was, which the World Bank says is uh, $100 per ton, uh, of course, that pressure, the budgetary pressure will increase. 
Yeah, I mean, you really would not want to, it may be more cost effective for you to reduce your own emissions. So why wouldn't you do that? So what it ends up being is, is the only carbon credits you want to buy are those that you can't avoid. So it really is residual emissions that are hard to abate or technically unavoidable because it's just very expensive in that way to buy those carbon credits. Right. Um, but in the meantime, there are a lot of people who uh, wish to offset their residual emissions, but we hear critique a lot, especially from people who have not been involved in developing projects, carbon projects, that issuing credits uh, seems to be a complex and opaque process. We see this in the media um, quite a bit. They say it's carbon finance is complicated and it's, uh, you know, it can be manipulated. Um, is it complex? Is it opaque? <laughs> well, there's two different ideas here. So it is highly technical and that's what makes it complex and it needs to be very technical because carbon credits need to meet high quality criteria. And so a project developer will have to develop uh, monitoring and technical plans that actually can monitor, report and verify that that project is achieving emission reductions through the lifetime of that project. And while this plan and measurement is very technical and is done by a project developer, they have to adhere to the rules and regulations set by standards who actually issue and certify these emission reductions according to their own principles and criteria. Um, and from that, it also has you know, third parties and accredited verifiers who actually have to make sure everything is in accordance to what the standard is that the project developer is bringing forward. Um, this is highly technical measuring emission reductions is very highly technical, but it's required to make sure that those carbon credits actually do represent real emission reductions. Um, and it is complex, but it is also a very transparent process. So the certification standard does have a database that registers all the projects that are there and then also the issuance and final use of carbon credits. So it is transparent because you can look at this database, which is called a registry, and you can trace back which projects a carbon credit comes from. And this is a very rare thing that most commodities cannot claim, that level of traceability. Yeah, that's really interesting. Thank you. And so um, let's look at what constitutes a high quality carbon credit. I mean, a lot of people uh, write about and they ask, how do I even know that I'm buying a high quality carbon credit? How, how do I go around making sure that what I'm buying is robust, additional, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, it's exactly like what you said, those principles. So um, fortunately, uh, an industry body has come together called the International Carbon Reduction and Offset Alliance, or for short, we say ECROA, and they have developed a best practice guide on the principles that carbon pre projects and carbon credits must follow. So they do have to be real. They do have to be additional. That means they have to go above and beyond what would have already happened in the country. They have to be measurable, verifiable, permanent. So that means there's not a risk of these emissions actually being released into the atmosphere and they have to be used in that way. That means no two carbon carbon credit buyers can use that same credit. It can only be used once, which is why you have something like a registry. So what ECROA has done is not only defined these principles, but have actually um, rated standards. So the different certification standards, they've actually seen whether they have the processes in place to adhere to these principles. And if they do, so in other words, they're ACROA approved, that means any carbon credit that you buy from these ACROA approved standards, so examples are verified carbon standard or the gold standard, they, that is a way in which you know you're buying carbon credits that are certified to the highest quality standards. Okay, great, wonderful. So um, I, in the interest of, of uh, time, uh, I wanted just to bring, you know, go through a little bit some of the take home messages here. Um, I think that we can say that, uh, that we feel that climate action through the voluntary carbon is, a, is key to reach targets set under the Paris Agreement. Um, we feel that the carbon, the voluntary carbon market is transparent and robust. It is fit for purpose in scaling up carbon action. And um, it's clear that carbon credits put a price on carbon, both uh, an internal price, like Maria has explained, um, as well as an explicit price. Obviously, when carbon credits are purchased, that's the, that's the price they, they have. Uh, and this incentivizes a company to reduce and finance emission reductions from carbon projects. 
Um, I wanted to go ahead and open up the floor to uh, questions, any questions that we have. Um, uh, and thank you so much, Maria and Renat. Renat, did you want to say a couple of um, closing words before we go over to Q&A? Well, I think uh, Maria summed it up nicely, the art to top that's those statements. But uh, so I would propose we go straight into in, into questions. Great, wonderful. So um, uh, here is a, a question that we see with the unveiling of South Pole's climate neutral checkout. Okay, so we're already getting quite technical, uh, and and uh, um, I don't know, uh, Renat, if you can uh, if you can try to explain what the climate uh, neutral checkout is. But how how does how large of an impact do you see consumers? making and offsetting emissions compared to that of uh, corporates or companies? This is for, for uh, Renat. That's a very good question because um, that's actually, so far we have been talking about the private sector as an end user of carbon credits and, and therefore climate finance. But of course, companies can also act as a multiplier. For example, write that by, let's say you are offering, I don't know, um, you're offering shoes on your website or bags, you could decide to offer a climate neutral option on the website and make it very easy for clients to, to just, uh, just flip a switch and pay some money on top of the bag and make it climate neutral. By that, the company can invite its own clients to be part of the journey. And that is exactly uh, one of the products that the Southpool offers. We have technology, uh, plugins that allow essentially on every website to include such a feature and straight away invite your client base to join in and be part of this big financing effort. And do you think, Renat, that that is going to change the way that companies um, do business? Do they? Is that going to put uh, a different type of pressure on them to up their sustainability game, or is it just a uh, lipstick on a pig, so to speak? I wouldn't kind of call that pressure. I all, anyway, I think this word pressure is the wrong word. I, I think honestly, I mean, we, we this this transition to a climate friendly world. Too many times we have the idea that this means now we have to really get very serious and and absolutely you know in fact if you are able to, uh, to back to my my example of the bag you're getting that bag you're happy with it and you enjoy the fact that the the emissions that were related to that bag are now compensated perhaps in a project that happened where your cotton comes from for the bag i mean that's not I wouldn't call that pressure. That's fun. Why, why wouldn't you love that? Um, and I think for a company, it's more a statement that, hey, we are part of the show and we invite you to be part of the show as well. So I think we should get away a little bit from this pressure kind of narrative towards more, hey, look, we, we, are, we need all hands on deck. We need to finance the transition and, you know, let, let's all turn in. And you sometimes talk about the fact that uh, living in a climate-friendly way shouldn't, as I mentioned in the intro, shouldn't be seen as a burden. It's not necessarily something that's going to limit your lifestyle, but rather it's a different type of lifestyle. It's a climate-friendly lifestyle, but it is just as high quality as it was, let's say, before in a carbon-intensive lifestyle. I think absolutely. I mean, if I walk uh, Zurich streets, uh, it's it's full of these cool burger joints which sell vegan burgers and these vegan burgers are super nice so you know I, I eat one of these burgers it's super cool it's super nice and i just saved a lot of co2 by not eating a beef burger which uh, basically where the cow was roaming around brazil and eating soy from a deforested land what again is my disadvantage like that's not something that I regret. This is a great burger, tastes nice, and is climate friendly. So, and there's there's just a small example, but there's tons of examples where climate friendly behavior is not uh, only cleaner, but also nicer and cooler to do. So, also that is a narrative you have to overcome. Uh, climate action is is not 
restriction in our lifestyle. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Um, and that, uh, by the way, that, that uh, in my personal opinion, when you look back at the growth curve for voluntary climate action, I honestly believe it, there's an opportunity. We, we can actually manage this transition to a, to, to a degree or even 1.5 degree a, a world without having to reduce our lifestyle. That's, that's the wrong narrative that has been planted in our heads uh, by people who have different agendas. And it's really, it's time to get that narrative out of our head. Great. So um, thank you, Renat. So now there are a couple of questions that are a little bit more technical. This is for Maria. How can you ensure that the mission behind each certificate is actually removed? Is there a reliable way to track it? Are these criteria publicly available? So this is into the nitty gritty of carbon finance. Go ahead, Maria. Yes, you can. But when we mean by removal, I'm just going to clarify that removal credits are those that directly come from projects that capture emissions from the air and then store it permanently. And so you can uh, look at standards, so certification standards that have methodologies for removals technologies, and this could be nature-based. So afforestation and reforestation activities are an example of a removal credit. And then also for uh, technology-based I will say there are not as many technology based yet, but this is something that is being developed. So what you can do is go to uh, standards and see what methodology. So and that actually enable removal of credits to occur. And then from that, you could if you want to get on the technical side on how they measure that you can. But also the standards registries will show you then which credits uh, actually are removals credits. And so then you can see uniquely see which are the carbon credits that remove emissions from the air and are stored. And that is a way in which you can track removals credits. So right now, most of the removals credits do come from nature-based solutions, but we will see as technologies such as carbon capture and storage come to the fore and methodologies are developed for that, that will be something where we can see more removals credits coming from. And I'm not sure that Lisa um, specifically meant removals credits. She might have meant ERs in general, emission credits. Uh, yes. Uh, then credits in, in general, that, of course. Yeah, in that case, yes, exactly. So you can look into different standards. Uh, the methodologies gives you really the technical documents. Uh, you have to be an engineer, but you don't have to be, but it's a wonderful exercise in taxing your brain on reading through a methodology and really understanding how do they measure emission reductions? What are the ways in which, like I said, the monitoring, reporting and verification occurs? But then you can also look at a registry of the standard and you can see the different carbon credits that are there. You will be able to track which project it comes from, what are the methodology it actually uses to have that emission reduction, when was that emission reduction actually issued, and so and whether it's cancelled or not. So there's a whole bunch of attributes that you can track of that carbon credit. Each carbon credit will have a unique identifier in the registry. So you really have that transparency of knowing what type of carbon credit you're buying and what was the methodology it was certified under and under that, what is the quality of it. And so here are a couple of uh, questions also on pricing to follow up. So first of all, um, I'll read a couple of them. Uh, a recent report by the task force on scaling up the voluntary carbon market states that the carbon credit prices need to increase by two or three times. This makes absolute sense. But to who is this money going? That's one question. Secondly, to ensure that your carbon price is high enough to be an incentive for emission reductions, wouldn't public authorities such as the EU be best placed? Isn't there a risk that a voluntary only approach sets the bar too low? And then the third is, how is the price of a carbon certificate determined? Those all kind of go together, Maria, if you would like to um, tackle that. Oh, um... Well, I'll start off with what we call compliance markets versus voluntary markets. So compliance markets are any um, any place in the world that has actually set a price on carbon. This could be through a carbon tax. It could be through something called an emissions trading scheme, which is in operation in the European Union. Uh, the European Union actually has set uh, different design mechanisms on what the price cannot go below. Well, design mechanisms to ensure that the market isn't over flooded with what they have as allowances. So the EU does not allow for carbon credits to be part of their market. And in that way, you're talking about two different types of commodities that can be used for compliance. So the EU does set a carbon price through allowances. It doesn't allow for carbon credits. In this case, 
really uh, a facility that is under the European Union emissions trading scheme can only buy allowances. So something to be aware of, there are very different, like the voluntary carbon market doesn't play a role in the EU ETS. Um, but there are other types of compliance markets which do allow for carbon credits to be used as part of your compliance. And even there, we're seeing because of the fear that the carbon price will be deterred, they have put different types of design mechanisms to ensure that the carbon price is still high. So they can either restrict, they, a lot, most of them do actually have a restriction on how many carbon credits you can use. Um, and they also have quality restrictions. So that's in the compliance markets. When it comes to the voluntary market, this is a very key thing. The voluntary market operates where no policy is in place. It's trying to target and incentivize companies that don't have any other incentive because the government's not forcing them to, to still undertake actions by buying carbon credits to reduce. And in that case, uh, what we really do encourage companies is to pay a fair carbon price, align your carbon price to some, like if you have an internal carbon price, why not use that as the barometer of what types of carbon credits you can buy? So what you're automatically financing is those carbon credits that fetch a higher price. And we do see differentiation in the voluntary carbon market so that those uh, projects that are that achieve a lot of sustainable development goals tend to get a higher price. Why not buy those? And that way you're incentivized to not only reduce your own emissions, but you're financing high quality projects. And so so just to clarify, how is the how is the price of a carbon certificate determined? Sorry, did you want to jump in there, Renan? I just want to to add one one point, perhaps which a bit goes into the, your uh, your next question. Where does that money go, right? And one thing I can guarantee you: the money certainly does not go. It doesn't get stuck in any kind of trading house or whatever. The money goes to the project for a simple reason: we're currently short credits. It's a shortage currently. We we don't have sufficient credits globally to meet all this demand. We need to now finance new projects. And the low-hanging fruit in the old days were typically renewable energy credits, which are no longer additional. And therefore, or many of them, uh, many of the uh, of the new plants you finance are financed anyway. And as soon as a, a, a power plant is financed anyway without the help of carbon finance, it loses its so-called additionality. So uh, increasingly such credits are no longer on the market. So we are increasingly looking at the next level of projects. And to ramp up uh, a project like the one I showed before on agroforestry, we you need prices of at least $10, $20 a ton. You cannot finance it otherwise. So the shortage in carbon credits right now automatically leads to higher prices because we, we need more money to finance the project. And in a way, that already partly answers the, the next question, who determines the price? Ultimately, it's supply demand. We have certain criteria, as Maria mentioned. So uh, every carbon credit, as Maria mentioned, needs to be additional, real, measurable, certified, and so on. So that uh, uh, whatever, if you buy a credit, you can be sure that this is truly one ton avoided or removed. And, and then it's about um, it's it's about about supply and demand. And it, as I said, it is simply that the more ambitious we get, the less low-hanging fruit are out there, and prices are going to increase up to a point where we have so much volume that prices might at some point decrease again, simply because we're playing at much higher scales. That could happen. But for the next couple of years. I anticipate prices to rise and the money actually going into the projects and absolutely nowhere else. And so, um, so here, follow-up question on that. Um, how do you see the evolution of prices for permanent removal credits? Any idea of prices five to 10 years from now, if you can look into a crystal ball? I, I'm not going to see what the price is going to be, but what I'll say is, is that the demand for permanent removal credits is going to increase for two reasons. One, because uh, com countries themselves are going to increase their policy action, which means that a lot of the carbon credits that would be certified under avoided or reduced 
go under country policy and country efforts. So they're no longer additional. This may not happen by 2030, but definitely by 2050. What that means is the more expensive credits, which is primarily from removals technologies, are less likely to be covered by countries because it's very difficult for them. They don't have the technology, in which case the market, the supply of carbon credits will reduce and with demand being as such that they there's even more pressure to um, uh, compensate for your residual emissions because if you set a net zero target and also a lot of reporting standards are requiring seem to give the indication by then that removals technology credits will be valued the demand will be much greater than supply and these credits are already very expensive but I, I'll let Reynat see if he wants to go into an actual crystal ball on pricing yeah, it's a, it's indeed it's a crystal ball. Though the one thing I just uh, I could add is if we talk about technical removals like sequestration, there the lowest prices I've ever seen are clearly above a hundred euro per ton. That's very that's even way above the current e-way price and way above the levels many of us are used to in uh, in, in the voluntary carbon markets. And still, we have clients who pay it. So we, we actually we do transaction at those levels at those prices. Um, yeah, I leave it there. I'm just saying there is currently a pretty wide range of price levels depending on uh, on how you reduce or remove or avoid emissions. Um, but I think the, this this price levels of, of technical removals shows us that it's another in hint that I let me put it this way: I would be surprised if we saw a big decline in pricing in the next couple of years. Huh, interesting. Um, so uh, here are a couple of other questions before we move on to a question on, on carbon neutrality. How do we prevent the private sector from passing on the carbon costs that they are incurring to the end consumer? So let's say we work with a company and their costs go up because they're, uh, you know, going carbon neutral. They have a net zero target. How can we prevent them from in, uh, from just passing on those costs to the end consumer? This person says we need a green transition on a large scale. How do we ensure it's it, ensure it is a just one? Well, <laughs> or um, both? Yeah. Well, I'll just say one thing in terms of passing on the cost to the end consumer could be a good signaling that they are buying a much more a product that actually has compensated for their emissions. So the end consumer may be also willing to pay the higher price because they know at least this product has compensated for their emissions. So don't forget that it could be a market premium. Now for, uh, in that's one of the things, that's where labeling becomes really important, where the uh, com company can signal, I am, uh, the reason why this product is more expensive is because I've actually bothered to compensate for our emissions. I've tried to make this as carbon neutral as possible. Uh, Reynant, if you want to add? Well, I think to a certain degree, uh, I, carbon pricing is going to be passed on to consumers. Because ultimately, carbon pricing also must kind of bring, give guidance, uh, let, let me put it this way, like uh, air traffic flights, in nominal terms, flights today are way, way cheaper than in the 1970s. And to a certain degree, part of the current pricing has to be passed on to also essentially create the relative, attract relative attractiveness of taking a train. At the moment, you fly from Zurich to Berlin, the, 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 the plane is just much cheaper than the train. So who would take the train for that? So I think a certain degree of price adjustment needs uh, is uh, will happen and this and i think it's a good thing that it happens actually okay so i'll i'll take to uh take it up so if you're doing it in the voluntary carbon market you do want to signal that you're doing uh something that the consumer would potentially value um but at the second time that is actually exactly what reynat said the point of a carbon price is to actually internalize the cost of climate damage and it should then equalize so that the consumer can choose according to uh, something that's more carbon intensive, that price has been put in and they can make different choices. Um, one of the key things on this question of just transition though, if it's in a compliance market, so for example, the power sector and you're in the EU, 
and you want to make sure there's a just transition, there are ways in which the revenues that are raised from carbon pricing can be redistributed to help those who are poor. And uh, we have actually seen that, that countries worried about those who would bear a higher uh, burden of that carbon price, actually the revenues that are used um, or go into programs that could actually reduce their burden through energy efficiency improvements or through even updates uh, in places. So even in the EU, uh, for those countries which have very carbon intensive power facilities, there's the modernization fund, which comes from the revenues collected from carbon, the sale of carbon allowances, then go towards helping modernize and reduce the carbon intensity of those regions. So there's a way in which you can design a carbon price generally to address just transition. So that, that leads us to a question on, on uh, carbon neutrality and companies. It says companies can currently claim carbon neutrality, but that can mean different things to different companies. For example, what's included in scope three emissions? Do you think companies should be aiming uh, for past 2060 certification or what do you advise? And actually, at this point, uh, I'd like to bring in um, our uh, managing consultant for climate strategies, Ben. So ben, so do you want to uh, maybe tackle this question? Uh, do you think companies should be aiming for some sort of certification? Uh, what type of, uh, what does carbon neutrality mean? And can it mean different things for different companies? Yeah, hi everyone. Uh um, yeah, definitely it means a lot of things, or at, at, at least in the past it meant a lot of things for a lot of companies and I think there's still a lot of confusion in the air um, as these, these terms of um, climate neutrality, climate positivity, negativity, net zero, these are all uh, were sort of uncertain and used uh, interchangeably. But uh, what we always say is that just refer to the IPCC definitions and try to try to yeah um, use guidelines from certifications like like the plus 2016 which we also use to to define our labels and the label boundaries okay great thank you so much so just uh, just uh, refer to the uh, ipcc and um can you just for those who don't know what is example what is included in scope one emissions scope two emissions and scope three emissions just to clarify that for people who don't know Yes, so, so um, this this approach uh, towards like um, selecting um, scopes um, and clustering emissions into scopes is coming from the GAG protocol, which is the most widely known and used um, sort of methodology to assess and estimate uh, emissions, um, greenhouse gas emissions. And basically, um, what it does is that it qualifies all emissions, all direct emissions under scope one. Uh, so everything that is uh, on the premises, for example, uh, any kind of um, um, natural gas consumption in the buildings or any kind of direct fuel consumption from vehicles, uh, so mostly fossil fuels, but also some other refrigerants and so on. Scope 2 is basically the, all the purchased uh, energy, which in most cases is electricity, but also heat or steam or cooling. And Scope 3 is this large chunk of indirect emissions um, which is usually the, the most challenging part for companies that includes everything from the supply chain. So this upstream part and there's this downstream part after the point of sale, for example, what happens with the company's product after the point of sale, for, ex for example, during consumer uh, use phase and so on. Thank you, Bense. So here we have a couple of interesting questions. Uh, I think for Renat, but Maria, you can also jump in. What actions do we need from governments to drive public and private climate action? I know that um, that you, Renat, have uh, strong opinions on this. And um, so what, what's the government action, go government policy that we need to see? And, and an interesting question here, um, which is a little long, I'm going to try to see if I can say this more succinctly. In a macro level, in the time of a Paris Agreement, how can we be confident that voluntary action uh, is not based on existing or future policy anticipation that make them commit to acting? Because what this person is saying, in such situations, uh, would voluntary carbon markets cease to exist as everything falls under some sort of a compliance market over the time? I'm not sure you got that question, uh, Renat, um, but basically, 
it would voluntary action cease to exist is if everything falls under some sort of a compliance market over time i guess if i uh, i um i would be happy to hear uh vincent and um, maria as well on, on that topic but i can give it a, a shot uh in prince in theory yes absolutely if we were uh, able if, if globally governments would indeed agree to actually move us towards one point 1.5 degree target and would enact policies that would actually um, uh, sustain those pledges, then indeed, I think at some point we would actually no longer need any um, voluntary markets. And by the way, we would no longer need any science-based targets. We would no longer need any uh, net zero targets. We would no longer need any targets because essentially the, this is the classic theory of, of, of economy governments set the rules and companies act according to the rules if governments indeed did all that we could all go home and just let destiny unfold and bring us towards uh, towards net zero now the problem is I don't, i'm not seeing this i'm not seeing this happening at the moment and I'll give you just a small example which which personally bothers me uh, 2021 has been the start of the paris agreement a country like Indonesia, for example, I'm not sure where you saw this, but there is this new law called the Omnibus Law, which Indonesia enacted right at the beginning of 21, which we, it's it's basically a, a law designed, this, uh, designed to create jobs and to empower the economy after COVID. And in this law, there is reduced impact assessments for cutting trees. It's more subsidies for uh, extracting coal. It's all these things which go exactly against the Indonesian NDC. So at the moment, I'm just not convinced yet that these NDCs and pledges by governments are actually enacted on the ground. And this is why I think we absolutely need zero. Uh, we need net zero targets. We need climate neutral targets. We need voluntary markets. But again, if I'm wrong, and I hope I'm wrong, I'm really, I, 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 I honestly hope to be wrong. Then absolutely, that would be uh, ideal. Then we would, uh, yeah, we would no longer have to worry that much. So when you, when this person is asking, what do we need from governments to drive public and private climate action? We need them to basically put into law, put into regulation their NDCs. Exactly. Not just pledge, put them into law. Make it the make it the rule in your country. I'd, I'd take it one step further. To be honest, what we need is to governments to actually set a price on carbon. So right now, only 22% of global greenhouse gas emissions, only 22% have a price on carbon, and it's only existing in 46 countries. This is nowhere close to where we need to be. And we know a carbon price, actually, when it's strong, right now, if you were to think about it, like I think the average uh, carbon price, if you were to look at it from those 46 countries is about $10. That's nowhere close to what it needs to be to actually move transformations. So what actually needs to occur is, is that every government actually puts a carbon price on every single emissions, because what that does is it forces, and that price actually has to be high enough that it forces companies to want to make changes. They suddenly realize, and, and it's an enforced carbon price. So we've seen in the heyday of the EU, and in fact, this is coming now where the EU carbon price is going over 40 euros, Company, and this seems to be something that they recognize as being a long-term carbon price, that changes their long-term decisions. That starts them thinking, oh, I can't afford to continue to emit the way I'm emitting. I need to start investing into those technologies or those processes that will actually reduce my emissions. And that is what, that would be the ultimate thing. We're not here for the voluntary carbon market for the sake of having the voluntary carbon market. We have the voluntary carbon market because governments aren't putting a strong carbon price on all emissions. And governments have several reasons for this. There's a lot of political economy uh, reasons. We've seen jurisdictions like Alberta and Australia actually lose governments because the previous government tried to be strong on a carbon price. So this is not, you can understand why governments may not always want to put a strong carbon price, but they need to in order to give the private sector a long-term signal. In the meantime, that's what the voluntary carbon market is there for. And if companies are responding by the voluntary carbon market in anticipation of a compliance market, that's only a good thing. <laughs> that means they're preparing 
for stronger compliance regimes. But what we'd want is those stronger compliance regimes because that provides credibility that all companies have to take action, not just the ones who voluntarily choose to. Thank you, Maria. So we only have uh, about three minutes left and we have a lot of questions. Let's see. Let's, if, let's see, Maria, if you can do this quickly. What are the best removal standards for soil carbon sequestration and is there a current carbon trading platform for ease of sale purchase? Oh, <laughs> um, I'm going to leave that to my projects team, but I believe, actually, Reynat, you may know it better, but I believe uh, VCS is actually developing a lot of soil carbon methodologies for that. But uh, I think that's going to be something that uh, the projects team, I'll defer to them. We'll, we'll invite you to, to uh, uh, contact our projects team to talk about that. A current carbon trading platform for ease of sale purchase. Well, we sell per carbon credits on our, uh, on our webpage website. Any, any yeah, others? Something that's very exciting is IHS Market has actually created a meta registry that connects a lot of voluntary registries together. So that's just a way for you to see all the different carbon credits that are there. It's not necessarily something that you can just automatically buy the credits, but you actually can know what the, the different credit regimes are. Um, so that's very exciting. But yeah, otherwise you would... Can you tell us again what the name of that was, Maria? The IHS Market. Okay, excellent. Um, it's and a, then I it's think called Meta yeah. Registry. Okay. Renat, any, any suggestions? Renat? No other than saying there is, it is quite exciting, there's, there's a, kind of a number of such trading platforms coming up which will allow also, which is what one argument often heard, there is too little transparency in pricing. That's soon going to be solved because we have a lot more price information where um, ensuring also that there is no extended extensive profit making by by traders and brokers you can't because you're going to be out competed so the i'm really looking forward to have this uh, this this more transparency so that that you can really um ensure that the funding you're actually paying is going straight to the to the projects because anything else you're not going to be competitive so that's one of the beauties about this growth of the market it's going to be bigger more more transparent, even has um, more price information, and I think that's that's to the to the good of of all of us, and specifically to the good for the project developers who need security for long-term finance of what they're trying to achieve. And then I'm going to sneak in a a, a, a little um, sort of uh, here's an interesting question on red, which is always a little controversial. Uh, and we have we're right on time here, so this will be the last question, and I'm going to give it to you, uh, Renat. What do you think about the ethics of implementing a carbon offset project in a developing country? Some authors consider Red Plus projects a form of land grabbing or establishing property over natural resources. What do you think of this? I know that you have strong opinions about uh, uh, providing financing for Red projects and others. Well, that's a very, we, we have to extend for one hour and have another workshop on this very big question. But I think the one approach, very long story, very short, is um, keep in mind a Red Plus project does not change anything in terms of ownership of the land. So we're not, for a, a Red Plus project, it does not at all interfere with any land rights and so on. The only thing it does, it rewards whoever is the landowner for not to stop the deforestation and protect the land. By the way, the plus in red plus is important. It's not only stop the deforestation. The plus means you have to show that you use the proceeds of, of the carbon transaction to actually um, bringing additional benefit to the communities that are sitting on the land. That's the plus in red plus. So I, I'm a bit at odds. I don't understand why, where this land grabbing idea comes from, particularly not if I compare to what's actually happening in the baseline, which is big logging companies come in, uh, take down the forests, uh, extraction companies come in, build a big gold mine in the land. That I would say is, is land grabbing. I, I, I'm still, I don't fully understand where the land grabbing would come in in terms of Red Plus. Red Plus is, is a pure incentive scheme. You protect the tree, you're, you're enhancing the benefits on the ground, and you're getting compensated for that. That's more or less what Red Plus is. At least I'm talking about good, good Red Plus. 
And once again, as Maria said, of course, with this certification, we should only talk about good projects and not about uh, bad projects. All right. Well, thank you so much. On that note, thank you so much, Renat, Maria, Bense, everyone. And we hope that you enjoyed this. We will provide the recording to everyone who uh, registered. And we hope to see you in other uh, webinars hosted by South Pole. Thank you so thank much you and much. goodbye. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye.